वेलकम बैक माई सेल्फ पुष्पेंद्र सिंह एंड वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद अवर डेली करंट अफेयर्स सो टूडे यू विल हैव द डेली करंट अफेयर्स फॉर फोर्टीन ऑफ जनवरी टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन और लाइट एंड टूडे यू विल हैव ऑल्सो द मकर संक्रांति सो फ्रॉम माई साइड एंड फ्रॉम फ्यूचर आई एस आई वी विश यू ऑल द हैप्पी मकर संक्रांति एंड बेसिकली वी आर गोइंग टू कवर द डेली करंट अफेयर्स प्रोग्राम और डेली करंट अफेयर्स थ्रू दिस क्लासेस and uh, these are meant for those students who are preparing for the upsc civil services examination as well as other competitive examination right and uh, i am basically covering here the two national newspapers the first is basically the hindu and the second is indian express all right so these are the two national newspapers you can read you can read these newspapers right the first is basically the hindu and the second is indian express all right so this is so i'm basically referring the two new, two national newspapers the hindu and indian express all right and uh, you can refer both of these newspapers both of these newspapers are equally good and i would strongly recommend you to refer the hindu newspaper which is most essential for the upsc civil services examination as well as other government competitive examination all right so let's start with our daily current affairs for the 14th of january 2021 all right so first of all the adultery first of all the adultery so what is adultery means the adultery means it is a voluntarily sexual intercourse between a married person and you know uh, with someone who is not you know his or her spouse so that means if the man is basically involved in the voluntarily intercourse with some other you know the female other than her other other than his wife then this this you know act would amount to the adultery now why this news is is flashing regarding adultery here is that in 2018 in 2018 the five the five member bench of the supreme court of india basically you know uh, decriminalize the adultery in india so that means the section 497 the section 497 which governs right which governs the adultery in india have been declared null and void have been declared null and void by the supreme court of india so which has led to the decriminalization of adultery in our country right now now this is applicable equally to all all persons which are residing in our country right or the citizens of our country now what is happening is that there are issues of the implementation of this of this verdict which was delivered in 2018 the first issue is that regarding the armed forces now the armed forces which are also related to the indian navy indian army and indian air force now the persons who are serving in these in these you know the armed forces they are finding very very difficult right to maintain the strong sense of the discipline without right without this provision so what is happening is the morale of the armed forces can or the discipline you know the nature of the discipline can also be tarnished if such provision is to be implemented in the armed forces also so now the one petition was filed by the ministry of defense right with the supreme court of india seeking seeking the exemption from 2018 judgment which decriminalized the adultery in our country right so this petition was filed before the three judge or three member bench of the supreme court of india but you must understand the three member judge judge bench it cannot basically cannot basically deal with such issues because in 2018 judgment was delivered by the five member bench but this is the three member bench so what this three member bench did is basically the the three member bench is led by the justice rohinton pali nariman which has basically referred right uh, this issue to to basically to the constitutional bench the constitutional bench is basically consisting of the five or more judges in the bench and he, and the justice rohinton basically referred the matter to the chief justice of india right to pass a necessary order right uh, uh, to clarify the impact of 2018 judgment on the armed forces now why why the government is seeking the exemption first of all you must understand the government is seeking the exemption because uh, because there are the concern regarding the minds of the armed personnels because you must understand these armed persons are basically serving the country in the far flung areas 
if some of these persons are serving in the northeastern part of a country some of these persons are serving in the in the in the, in the himalayan belt some of these persons are serving right in the western border of our country so now what is happening is since they are operating very far away from their families right these challenging conditions about the families indulging in untoward activities may impact you know the armed forces right and uh, the personnel which is related to the arm which is related to the army navy and air force is considered as a distinct class right and they are governed by the separate set of legislation for example article 33 basically you know uh, you know protected you know article 33 which allowed the government to modify fundamental rights now the fundamental rights which are applicable to the citizens of our country right there are further more right uh, you know the restrictions which are imposed right because you must understand no fundamental right is absolute so there are reasonable restrictions which are imposed right by the parliament on the fundamental rights of the citizens of this country now now since these fundamental rights are there they are still absolute they are not absolute for the common citizens of this country right the article 33 still provide right further more restrictions further more restrictions right which are available to the common citizens of this country so that means the government under article 33 is empowered to modify the normal fundamental rights which are available to the citizens of our country right for the armed forces right these with these modifications or these changes in terms of the the fundamental rights is you know is to ensure that the arm the arm force personnel basically you know uh, perform their duties right without any you know uh, you know fear and favor and without any you know any sort of you know the 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 ethical issues while performing their duties so here the adultery amounted to unbecoming conduct in the armed forces and it is also a violation of the discipline under these three acts right so here the ministry of defense basically seeking the exemption from uh, from 2018 judgment of the supreme court of india which basically decriminalized the adultery in our country so it is seeking to again you know not to imp- not to implement this you know this 2018 judgment for the armed forces in our country all right next the rbi working group on the digital lending the rbi working group on the digital lending so here you must understand the reserve bank of india basically constituted a working group right so it is related to the digital lending so digital lending means there are some sort of a online platforms right these online platforms and the mobile apps like you are also using some of the online platforms for internet banking right there are certain mobile apps also right in your android phone which is also used for transferring the money isn't it so they are also known as the digital lending platforms now now these digital lending platforms right have lot of issues also regarding the regulations right for the better financial sector right so what is happening there are lot of players in this the digital lending platform so for resolving those issues related to the digital lending the reserve bank of india has constituted a working group right a working group on the digital lending which include which include the online platform and the mobile apps so now this working group will basically study the all aspects of the digital lending activities right and it will also you know uh, you know certain certain other aspects are also uh, you know are involved by some of the unregulated players in this market so this working group this working group consisting of both the internal and, and external members right and uh, this working group which is constituted by the reserve bank of india right uh, is basically chaired by the jayant kumar das the jayant kumar das is basically the executive director of the reserve bank of india all right so what is the mandate so let's understand the mandate of the working group the mandate of working group so first of all the first mandate is basically to evaluate the digital lending activities right to evaluate the digital lending activities right uh, you know by performed by the different you know the stakeholders in this enterprise or in this activities and also assess the penetration penetration means whether the digital lending activities has support say in the in the rural areas or in the urban areas how much they are able to penetrate with the people which are residing in the 
far flung areas or in the rural areas right and also the standards of outsourced digital lending activities in rbi regulated entities right so certain set of activities or certain set of the lending activities which are outsourced outsourced ka matlab hota hai the activities which are regulated by the parent organization but they are actually been you know implemented by some other third party so that is called outsourcing so certain parameters or certain standards are basically outsourced right in terms of the digital lending now they are they are well regulated by the R, by the rbi entities so ultimately the working group will evaluate the digital lending activities assessing the penetration how much the digital lending activities have been penetrated in the rural areas and also how what are the standards of such outsourced digital lending activities which have which are having the rbi regulated entities right and the second is basically it will also identify the risk posed by unregulated digital lending to the financial stability so there are a lot of you know unregulated digital lending activities are also performed on the digital platform now to to assess to identify the risk which are posed by such unregulated digital lending to the financial sector is also one such objective or the mandate of the working group all right and uh, this working group will also suggest the regulatory changes to promote the orderly growth orderly growth of the digital lending all right so it will ultimately suggest some sort of a regulatory changes right so that it can promote some of the changes or orderly growth of the digital lending uh, the process right so here this group will ultimately recommend the measures for the expansion of the specific regulatory and the and the and the statutory parameters right so it will also suggest you know various other regulatory and the governmental agencies right it will also suggest the role of various regulatory and the governmental agencies in this regard right in order to expand you know specific regulatory and the the statutory parameters right it will also recommend the robust fair practices for the digital lending players right so certain code right just like code of conduct so here the fair practice code which will be which will be ideally employed by the digital lending players in the market so it will recommend such practice practices code also and this group is mandated to submit the report right within 3 months so so this group you know uh, would basically submit the report in the 3 months only all right next lca tejas what is lca means it is basically light combat aircraft it is called light combat aircraft tejas so this light combat aircraft tejas is basically you know indigenously designed and the developed right so here what is happening is that why this why this news is is flashing that union cabinet has approved the procurement of the 73 you know the light combat aircraft which is also known as tejas mk 1a fighter aircrafts and 10 the 10 basically the light combat aircraft tejas mk 1 trainer aircrafts at the ultimate cost of 45000 crore rupees with the design and development of infrastructure sanctions worth of 1200 and 2 crore so ultimately the union cabinet has approved the procurement of 73 the lca tejas mk 1a fighter aircrafts and also the 10 lca tejas mk 1 trainer aircrafts at the cost of 45000 crore rupees all right and this light combat aircraft which is also known as uh, lca mk 1a is basically a variant of the indigenous indigenously designed and the developed and having the manufactured state of art modern fourth generation fighter aircraft so it is basically an indigenized version or indigenously designed developed version of the modern fourth generation fighter aircraft all right and this aircraft which is also known as the light combat aircraft is basically equipped with certain operational capabilities because ultimately the light combat aircraft will be you know which can be used in the in the battlefields also so it has certain critical operational capabilities these critical operational capabilities are for example the active electronically scanned array radar right beyond visual range missile right electronic warfare suit air to air refueling facilities right and uh, 
it will have you know uh, it will have certain features so that it can meet the operational requirement of indian air force at the time of their need at the time of their need so it will have the advanced features right which are at par with the fourth generation fighter aircraft right and this this procurement of the ministry of defense would be the first by indigenously designed developed and the manufactured category procurement of the combat aircrafts right so with that the indigenous content is having around 50% right and this will ultimately progressively reach into the 60% by the end of this program right so it will have the greater impact on the design and the development and the manufacturing capacities of india with regard to the manufacturing of the fighter aircraft which is also known as the light combat aircraft in india because until now what is happening is we are basically importing or we are basically importing some of the parts related to the fighter aircraft but now this aircraft which is indigenously designed developed and manufactured will boost the indian manufacturing capacity with regard to uh, with regard to basically you know the fighter aircraft all right and uh, and cabinet also approved you know the infrastructure development by indian air force right under the infrastructure development by right, this project will ultimately handle uh, you know some sort of a servicing at their base depot right so here the handle servicing will be there and uh, with their base depot so that the turn around time would get reduced so in the case of any sort of emergency or any sort of a mission which is very critical it will lead to the increased increased availability of the aircraft right within a short period of the time all right and this is basically a picture of the light combat aircraft pages all right next makar sakranti so makar sakranti everybody is enjoying already all right so here the vice president of india right uh, basically greeted the citizens of this country on the eve of the festival which is also known as the lohri makar sakranti right in the different different regions this festival is known by the different different name, names right but the ultimate significance remains the same ultimate significance remains the same so in some place it is called lohri for example in the punjab region some place it is known as makar sakranti another place it is sorry, southern india it is known as pongal right another place it is known as bhogali bahu uttarayan in rajasthan and the gujarat posh parvan right so these festivals are basically celebrated right uh, in the in the in the similar ways right uh, but they are di definitely diverse across the country right so this makar sankranti is basically a festival uh, according to the hindi calendar which is reference to the deity surya or deity sun right so it is with the reference of the sun why because you must understand it is according to the solar cycle according to the solar cycle or the deity surya so what is happening is that at the day of makar sakranti which is normally you know uh, uh, falling on the 14th of the january every year or one day before or after right so uh, in almost all part of the country right it is happening that almost 14th of the january or one day before or after this day is basically falling and uh, in some places this celebration can go also for four days and uh, there are a lot of other rituals also which used to uh, perform along with this makar sakranti right so here what is the significance is that the sun the sun basically uh, the right geographical concepts you people know about that thing for example this is your earth and this is your sun okay so this is basically for example this is your sun so what is happening is if i draw a bigger picture of the earth so you can see here so this is a this is the earth this is basically your equator this is tropic of cancer and this is tropic of capricorn all right so what is happening is that the sun never crosses the tropic of cancer and the sun never crosses the tropic of capricorn so on that day the 14th of the january right it is also the month of winter solstice winter solstice matlab the sun is located right uh, basically you know at the tropic of capricorn at the tropic of capricorn all right in the southern hemisphere so the rays are falling directly on the tropic of capricorn on the day of 14th of january right and the sun rays which is falling to the indian subcontinent right very obliquely 
so the indian subcontinent is facing basically winter time so it is known as winter solstice and uh, and during the winter time you know that the the days are smaller and the nights are longer and the nights are longer so what what is the significance of this day the sun started moving towards the tropic of cancer or towards the equator and transiting from the tropic of capricorn so it will pass through the equator and move towards the tropic of capricorn and with that with that the 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 longer days will get started so the days will become longer and the nights will become progress progressively shorter progressively shorter in the peak in the peak summer time and it is also having the the significance of the end of in you know, auspicious phase of the preceding month of like which is also known as posh posh is the month of this or is the name of the month right and it is also the beginning of ending of the chilling winter so everybody would have experienced the chilling winter especially in the northern part of our country right and so it is a, it is the end of this chilling winter and uh, and this occasionally you know uh, or this basically occasion is used to celebrate the hard work of the millions of our farmers right and the peoples across the country right which is basically celebrated as the harvest festival throughout the country right so it is also celebrated at the harvest festival it is the it is the end of the chilling winter and it is also the month of posh and by that time the sun started moving towards the tropic of cancer and the days will become ultimately progressively longer and the nights will become progressively shorter right and this is these are the names of the makar sankranti so here you can see here the shishu sankranti is basically known in the jammu and kashmir the makar sankranti is known in the bihar and the jharkhand the mag bihu is known in the assam and northeastern region the kichri is known as uttar pradesh right the posh sankranti is known as the west bengal the makar sankranti is known in the odisha the pedu panduya is known in the andhra pradesh the pongal is known in the tamil nadu right the makara bilaku is known in the kerala the makara sankarama right is known in the karnataka the makar sankranti is known in the maharashtra and the madhya in the in the madhya pradesh right and uh, uttarayan is known in the gujarat and the rajasthan and the lohri or the maghi is known in the haryana himachal pradesh and the punjab region all right so it is the similar name but the ultimate significance or the essence of uh, this festival remains the same all right so this is what you must understand regarding the makar sankranti all right let's understand the meal worms what is the meal worms so they are basically worms so it is in they are in the news because the european right the europe basically you know uh, approved these meal worms right in the diets in the diet or in the food so so uh, so uh, very soon the europe's pasta balls or the dinner will have these meal worms right so they become the first insect approved right or any such insect approved in the region as a human food which is not very common in the european region so it is the first such insect which is approved for the feeding purpose and it will be available as a food as a food in the european region right so let's understand what is the meal worm first of all the meal worm are nothing but the larval form of the meal worm beetle everybody knows about the beetle so it is the larva form of the beetle which is also known as the meal worm beetle all right and uh, it is a species of the darkling beetle it is a one species of darkling beetle and uh, and you know they are still considered as a beetle larva rather than considering them as a worm now this you know like all you know insects they also go through the four stages for example the first stage is egg the second stage is larva then pupa and the adult and if you see the the figure or if you see the, typically the measurement of them is basically the larva is around 2.5 cm or more right or the adults are generally 1.25 to 1.8 cm in the length right the recent decision is taken by the european food safety and agency which is which is basically you know the primary agency or primary regulator for the food safety just like a the fsai which is also the food regulator in our india so like that the efsa is the food regulator 
in the European, right? Uh, so this European Food Safety Agency, right, uh, taken the decision to implement the the meal bombs or you know these yellow grubs for you know to be used as a whole or it can be used in the dried form or it can be used as a floor, right? So it can be used either in the in the normal yellow grubs form or in the uh, you know, dried form or in the you know the floor forms, which will be which will be you know used in the biscuits, pasta, bread, and etc. Right? These meal worms are basically very rich in terms of fiber, in terms of fat, and in terms of protein, and they are likely to be the first first of many insects, right? Uh, which will be which will be featured on the European plates in the coming years. Right, so it is a big decision to uh, to uh, to use the meal worms as a dietary as a diet for the European people, and it is already approved by the European Food Safety Agency. And these are the basically the meal worms which will be used right uh, right in the European diet. All right, let's understand the mutual funds riskometer. So first of all. What is this riskometer, right? So it is first of all you must understand uh, the the mutual funds are basically regulated by the Security and the Exchange Board of India, which is also known as SEBI, which is also known as SEBI. So so this SEBI basically introduced right this riskometer, right? This riskometer was introduced on the fifth of October two thousand and twenty, uh, and this riskometer would be effective from January first two thousand and twenty one. Now, uh, now you must understand why. What is the need, or what is this riskometer? The riskometer is nothing but uh, to assessing the risk of, uh, you know, the mutual funds which are there in our country, and also to characterize those mutual funds, right, based on their risk label, based on their risk label in the six stages, right, the six stages from low to very high. So first of all, the ultimate purpose of this riskometer is basically. To characterize the mutual funds, the mutual funds you people are knowing about the mutual funds, right? So uh, people basically invest in the mutual funds, and based on the judicial decisions, they basically invest their money, the hard-earned money, in basically in the mutual funds. If those people would have the knowledge about the risk, the risk exposure, the risk exposure, or the level of risk the mutual funds are having. Right, they may judicially invest their money in the better mutual funds, which are having the lesser amount of risk. So it is ultimately an exercise which ultimately makes the mutual funds, or which ultimately characterize the mutual funds in the different class of categories, right? And it will basically, you know, inform the investors or the common citizens, right, which mutual fund will have the lesser amount of risk, and so that they can take their the informed decision and they can invest their hard earned money in the lesser risk category of uh, the the mutual funds isn't it now uh, the all mutual funds beginning from january 1st 2021 they would be assigned a risk level right so here the 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 mutual funds which are owned by right, some conglomerate so they will be assigning a particular risk level to those schemes right which have been which have been gone through the, through these mutual funds right and uh, and it is based on the scheme characteristics and this riskometer would be evaluated on the monthly basis so it will be reviewed it will be evaluated on the monthly basis right and here the fund houses are required to disclose such riskometer risk label right uh, regarding the various the mutual funds or the portfolios right for their all schemes right on their website so these fund houses Will be disclosing uh, the the riskometer risk label on their websites, right? Uh, they will be disclosing, right? Uh, you know the websites, right? Of the association of the mutual funds in India. So it is basically, you know, uh, you know, uh, with the association of the mutual funds in India, right? Within the ten days of the closing of every month, the fund house will be disclosing this information on their website. And any change, any change in the risk label or any change in the riskometer, right, with regard to the scheme, will be reflected clearly, and it will be communicated to the unit holders very clearly, right, regarding that scheme. And ultimately, as I told you, that scheme or that 
you know would definitely help the investors to make more informed investment decision so that will basically help the investors to get more informed investment decisions in the country all right here you can check it out the assigning risk label so here the risk meter will basically facilitate the characterization of your mutual funds regarding the the level of risk so it will basically mapping the risk label of the schemes which will be implemented through the mutual funds right so it is based on their portfolio of the investment so here you can say that the more is the risk value right more is the risk value the 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 greater will be the risk the greater will be the risk label to to uh, to invest in that scheme so here the risk value is you know based on the the number so it is if the risk value is less than or equal to 1 so here the risk label would be low as per the risk level meter right if the risk value is between 1 to 2 the risk label would be low to moderate or right? like if the risk value is 1 to 3 the risk level would be the moderate or right if the risk value is between 3 to 4 the risk level would be the moderately high if the risk value is between 4 to 5 right the risk level would be high and the risk value if the greater than 5 right the risk level would be very high right for that the schemes will be very very risky for the investors to to basically you know uh, to invest in those schemes all right let's understand ICT grand challenge for the development of smart water supply measurement and the monitoring system so first of all the information and communication technology it is basically ICT stands for right so it is ICT means information and the communication technology so ICT grand challenge so it is basically you know some sort of a grand challenge was organized right by the national jal jeevan mission under the department of drinking water and the sanitation uh, right along with the ministry of you know the electronics and the information technology launched this ict grand challenge right so the two flagship ministries the ministry of jal shakti and the ministry of electronics and information technology has launched this ict grand challenge right the ultimate purpose of launching this ict grand challenge is for the development of the smart water supply measurement and the monitoring system so here what is happening is that the lot of issues with the supplying of the water the lot of issues with the monitoring of those system also so here the grand challenge would ultimately facilitate the development of the system which is having the smart water supply measurement right so it will it will measure the water supply smartly and it will also monitor such supplying of the water and this grand challenge was uh, was basically you know uh, was basically launched on the 15th of september 2020 right so here the jal jeevan mission which is also under the department of drinking water and the sanitation right uh, is basically the user agency for the grand challenge for you know uh, for the smart meter supply measurement and the monitoring system so jal jeevan mission is basically a user agency and the cdac right the cdac bangalore which is a psu is basically an implementing agency and it is basically providing the technical support for the challenge for uh, for you know for launching or for the development of this smart water supply measurement and the monitoring system so under this under this you know uh, the ict grand challenge a total 218 applications were received right through this grand challenge and uh, it include from various various sectors right like indian startups and the individuals and the companies also right the results of this ict grand challenge right which received 218 application was announced basically on 20th of the november 2020 right so it was based on the jury so there are people who are basically you know acting as a jury so jury has disclosed the result on the 20th of november 2020 ultimately out of 218 applicants 10 applicants were basically selected right to uh, to creation or for ideation of the prototype stage right which will be uh, which will be you know uh, as a prototype for the development of smart meter supply measurement and the monitoring system right and they are the each of these 10 applicants have been supported with 7.50 lakhs of indian rupees 
right and uh, these prototypes are basically developed now what is happening is that uh, these prototypes which are developed by these 10 applicants they are also going to be evaluated right so these are going to be evaluated in the last week of january 2021 right by uh, another jury now this would basically you know a uh, water test bed is set up in the in the cdac facility in the bangalore at the electronic city campus for these evaluations and based on the evaluations certain you know applicant would definitely comes out as a winner right so it is basically an ict grant challenge for the development of the smart water supply measurement and the monitoring system all right let's understand colab cad what is this colab cad so here you must understand the colab cad is nothing but it is basically a software right for engineering graphics okay so it is a software just like a autocad so it is a software which will be used right uh, for the students or which will be used by the students who are studying in their class 11th and the 12th right so they are basically used by the students uh, as a part of their practical exercise right so who has developed this colab cad so here you must understand the national informatics centers uh, along with the mighty right along with the center board of secondary education under the ministry of education has jointly launching launching this colab cad software right this uh, this software has already launched now one of what is happening is this is that the cbse under the leadership of an is officer sri manoj ahuja introduced this colab cad software for the engineering graphics especially for those students right which are studying in their in their senior school level for example for the class 11th and 12th for the subject code of 046 right this this colab cad software will be ultimately used for the practical assignments right for example you have the practical assignments like the physics chemistry right uh, as a part of subject curriculum right so just like that you will have the practical assignments and this colab colab cad software will be used for such practical assignments as a part of the subject curricula and ultimate purpose of using uh, this colab cad software right as a part of your subject curriculum for practical assignment ultimate purpose was to make a different types of the 3d designs and the 2d drawings right so the people or the students which are studying in their class 11th and the 12th so they have become more accustomed of making the 3D designs and the 2D drawings with the use of this Colab CAD softwares. And uh, the students from around, you know, 140 plus schools uh, across the country has already been enrolled. All right. And the schools also from the Middle East, right, which are affiliated to the CBSE, has also been, you know, having the access of this software. Now, this software can be used by those schools or by those students of those schools. Right, for their practical projects and also they can understand the concepts of engineering graphics especially the types or especially the development of or especially the learning of the 3d designs and the 2d drawings in their schools itself all right so this is the prototype or this is you know a uh, software which will be used as a 3d as a 3d printing right or as a 3d design or 2d drawing for those uh, for those you know the engineering graphics so it is basically a 3d drawing all right Let's understand the new uh, news which is related to the millets. Okay, so millets you must you already know the types of the millet. Okay, there are different type of millet. For example, sorghum, pearl millet, ragi, right? Foxtail millet, right? Then you have the proso millet. Then you have the vernyard millet. Then you have kodo millet, and there are a lot of other millets also. Now, why the millets are there in the news? So first of all, you must understand the apida which is agricultural and processed food products export development authority which is nothing but the 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 authority which is which is basically you know is mandated with the 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 processed food product exportation right so for exportation of or for the export of the processed food product right this authority with the association with the andhra pradesh drought mitigation project which is basically launched by the Andhra Pradesh government for uh, for mitigation of the drought, right? Uh, so here, both of these APDA and APDMP, which is Andhra Pradesh Drought Mitigation Project, which basically you know uh, you know uh, you know organized a virtual buyer seller meet. So here, 
this virtual buyer seller meet is organized for the millet exporters so ultimately the ultimate aim is to you know uh, to find out the potential of the export of the millets from our country and this project is basically externally aided so it is funded by the ifad right and which is basically organized the virtual buyer seller meet where you know on the virtual platform the millet exporters and the millet you know the seller or buyer would be meeting and they will be you know transacting and they will be finding the scope of the export of the millet from our country so here you must understand the millet is the common name which is used for the small seeded grasses right which are often termed as the nutri cereals because they are nutritious in the nature and which is include the different types of the millet that i'll show you at the end of this slide uh, the different types of millets with their picture also all right now the millets are basically the cereal crops right which are generally the small seeded and known for very high nutritive values right so these millets are having very high nutritive value now uh, the ultimate purpose of this virtual buyer seller you know uh, the meat or the virtual buyer seller meat is basically to explore the potential of the increasing the export of the millets from our country right so here the ultimate purpose was to exploring the potential of increasing the export of the millets and the millet production and uh, and uh, the main focus is given by the government for the development of the millet sectors right of the nutri cereals all right and uh, you know the the epida which is also known as the andhra pradesh you know the drought mitigation project or sorry the the agriculture and process food uh, you know products export development authority is basically closely interacting with the indian institute of millet research which is a premier institute for for doing the research especially in the millet and and which are also involved in certain certain set of other stakeholders for exploring the potential of the increasing of the exports of the millets from our country so these are the different types of millet so you see basically the pearl millet okay the finger millet the fox tail millet the worm yard millet the kodo millet and the little millet so there are lot of different types of the millets which are available in the market all right let's understand the new news which is also known as the india uae mou for scientific and technical cooperation right so here you must understand that united you know uh, arab emirates so it is uae so both india and the uae ministries have basically signed an mou right for scientific and the te technical cooperation now the news which is flashing is regarding the union cabinet has approved this mou so union cabinet so what is the process is that two ministries or two uh, ministers may sign an mou that is memorandum of understanding between the two countries now later this memorandum of understanding would be approved by uh, by the cabinet and uh, and you must understand by approving of this cabinet they may they may also bring certain legislation in the parliament also isn't it so here the union cabinet or the indian union cabinet has approved the mou on the scientific and the technical cooperation right between the between the united arab emirates and between the government of india so here you can say that between the national center of the meteorology uh, the united arab emirates and the ministry of earth sciences government of india right so what will be the benefit of this signing of this mou or approving this mou so this mou would facilitate first of all the exchange of the widgets or the 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 experts or the scientist or the research scholars or the specialist they can basically you know uh, take out the widgets they can basically you know uh, you know take out the exchange of this experience regarding the development of this you know uh, uh, in terms of the scientific and the technical field and also these widgets will be done by these scientists research and the scholars right for the purpose of the research for the purpose of training for the purpose of consultation right and also for the purpose of the climate information services as well as the satellite data utilization for you know for forecasting and the tropical cyclone forecasting so you have understand about the cyclones the cyclones are basically you know uh, you know is basically low pressure system so to understand the cyclones forecasting right two countries are basically you know collaborating they are also collaborating for the research training and the consultation especially in the field of 
the scientific and the technical nature all right so here the cooperation will ultimately support the tsunami ulti tsunami early warning system early warning system or the center right so here uh, you know uh, in some form of like forecast modeling software right uh, which will be specially designed to support the tsunami forecasting operations right during the tsunami and uh, it will also cooperate in the field of seismology right for example the seismology is the science of the earthquakes right so here what happens is the the study of the seismic activities will be conducted so here you know uh, there is high potential that this tsunami wave right in the arabian and the oman sea you know uh, you know having the potential to generate the tsunami wave so is that really the earthquake can cause the tsunami wave right or the seismic activity is having the potential of generating this tsunami wave right to understand this phenomena or to study this relationship this uh, this cooperation will be immense useful and also it will be it will be you know helpful in the cooperation in the early warning of sand and the dust storms through the exchange of the knowledge through the exchange of knowledge all right and this is the picture where you can see that the united arab emirates which is basically you know uh, you know bordered by the by the by the countries like oman saudi arabia right here you have the bahrain you have the qatar it is the persian gulf right it is the abu dhabi dubai and it is gulf of oman so it is a political map where you can also relate with you know uh, with you know the united arab emirates that their position all right so thank you very much for attending this session so this all for the today and we will meet again tomorrow for our the new current affairs for the 15th of january 2021 so thank you very much i wish you happy i wish you happy uh, makar sankranti to all of you thank you very much